It's Christmas Day 2012. I'm Rim. I'm not Christian. <laughs> and neither am I. And this is Geek Night. Tonight on this lovely Xmas, we are talking about Hotline Miami. <laughs> the least Christmassy. <laughs> the most Christmassy game there is. Let's, Let's do this. I was actually trying to think of if there are any Christmassy games. Hotline Miami. I, no, but like I like legitimately Christmassy games, and I could not think of any. The only things I could think of were games like Rise of the Triad, where if you play it on Christmas, then there's like Easter eggs because it looks at the date on your calendar. Huh. There probably are some crappy Santa-ish games. But... I'm sure, but can you think of a Home Alone? I guess. Home Alone. I mean, Die Hard was an NES game. Yeah, Home Alone and Die Hard. <laughs> but I mean, can you think of legitimately Christmas themed, as in the theme is Christmas, not the theme is Home Alone, which is a Christmas movie, right? Games. So it's got to be the direct that, theme. That aren't just. So it can't be a game that aren't that just is about... like throwaway shovelware, you know, or like flash games for marketing purposes or bullshit like that. Why doesn't someone just make, I'm sure they exist and they're all terrible. The tower defense equivalent, but more like the resource management game of Santa's got to deliver all the presents. You could, then that could not, that could be pretty good. Yeah, it could be pretty good. You have to plot Santa's route. You have to manage all the elves to make enough presents. You might come up short. Then you get to figure out which kids to short. So then you start federating Santa, and you play years at a time. <laughs> You know, one year, year one, year no, two. No, it's got to be like Sim, uh, not Sim City. S Sim Pole. No, it's got to be like Aerobiz, Sim where Elf. you start in like the there's 1890s. Competing, there's, com there's competing Santas. There's other uh, Santas. No, you're you're fighting against Krampus. <laughs> I feel like most people didn't know about Krampus, at least not in the U.S. But just in the la like this year, for whatever reason, Krampus has come up. Like, there's been a bunch of college humor videos about Krampus. Uh, Krampus has come up in a bunch of web comics. I feel like you know what? It's not just you. This is the third time I've heard Krampus come up. Yeah. So why it did it come it up suddenly? It came up on the John Hodgman podcast. That's the first place I heard it. Why? Then I saw someone mention it in a comment on the internet. I'll and admit, you just said it now. That's the third one. The reason it's been on my mind That's is since, three more Krampuses than I heard last year. Since Halloween, when uh, everyone except Scott went to Chase's house to watch uh, possibly the third best Christmas movie ever made, <laughs> <laughs> Rare Exports, Okay, <laughs> which you should watch. I haven't heard of it. It is on the same level as Miracle on 34th Street. And, That's uh, okay. It's an yeah, okay movie. It's on that level of movie. The, of course, the black and white old one. Yeah. Not but, the... But, <laughs> that has remakes, you know. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, Let me look them up. Uh, uh, at least we agree Die Hard is the greatest Christmas movie ever made. And who does not agree with that? And I think Tokyo Godfathers is up there. Maybe number, maybe number two, three, four. Two, top five, easily. That's right, it's up there. There's a whole bunch of top fives. So today, I went skiing. Okay, there is a... Hold on, just to clarify before you go on your skiing. The one we like is the 1947 film. <laughs> there is... <laughs> A 1973 and a 1994 remake. Why? Well, I, the I, I know why. The 1973 was a TV movie remake, and the 94 one was a movie theater remake. All right, Scott. Which is better, Miracle on 34th Street or The Nightmare Before Christmas? Uh, As a Christmas movie. As a, well, then I had to say Miracle on 34th Street only because, <laughs> only because, not to say that it's better than Nightmare Before Christmas, but because Nightmare Before Christmas is also a Halloween movie. All right, all right, it all is, right. It is only half a Christmas movie. Miracle on 34th Street or It's a Wonderful Life? It's a Wonderful Life is way better. Okay. I, not even we close. Agree. We agree. It's a Wonderful mm -hmm. Life or Die Hard. <laughs> it's uh, uh, Die Hard. Is it's a an affirmation. Just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, unrelatedly, I think it was Pork Fry tweeted, you know, talking about a synchronicity. You follow here. Pork Fry? I follow Pork Fry. Okay. Recently, I for whatever reason, Twitter was like, hey, you should follow Pork Fry. And I was like, oh, I kind of know that guy. Does people listening know who the hell Pork Fry is? I don't know. <laughs> so I follow him now. And he randomly was like, our tradition is to watch Die Hard every Christmas. And Why was, wouldn't it be? But we were just talking about Die Hard. And then after that, there were two posts, two tweets by two people who don't know each other. They're not even the same spheres of the world. Mm -hmm. They're just two people. How could you tell? Because I just, I, they're two people I know independently. Okay. And they both tweeted within a few seconds of each other, and they had the words tamed in their tweets. One of them was talking about, I think, Satan, and the other one was talking about a role-playing game. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Die Hard, Krampus, Taming. I feel like there's what something going on What does Taming have here. to do with Krampus or Die Hard? It was a coincidence. What do you mean? Krampus? <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, there's been all the Krampus Krampus has nothing to do with Die Hard, and neither one of those have anything to do with taming. But they've all came up on Twitter recently. Sure. My Twitter. Okay, great. Anyways, I was skiing today. You know, I we've talked about skiing a little bit before. I'm I'm a I'm an avid skier. I'm a I'm not a professional skier. I don't do it as a job. I'm not ski patrol. You're I'm not, not a master either. I'm not the best skier You're in the world. Not a master or a professional. But I am a really good skier. <laughs> like I'm a I'm a I'm a pretty good skier at this point. And having skied at Hunter Mountain and on the East Coast a lot in the last few years in particular, one. What the fuck, dudes? Why do you show up to the mountain at, like, noon? It costs you the same. You ski, like, twice, and then you sit on your well, ass they don't at like the to top g- of the mountain for the rest of the day. You paid 70 bucks for that lift ticket. They don't, well, number one, why did they get there at noon? They don't like to get up early. Number two, why did they but sit But it on- closes at four. You already missed, you know, four and a half hours of skiing. <laughs> why do they sit at the top of the mountain? I have no fucking clue. I know. That would be like, if you went up... The water slide stairs. You got to the top, and they only let people go on the water slide one at a time. Now but you know imagine, why they do that. Imagine if, I, if everyone could go on the water slide at once, dude. If I get, wouldn't if I was you a kid, just go as soon as you got to the top immediately? If we were little kids and there wasn't that dude there with that minor authority over us, it would we would all die. Yeah, right. So it's skiing. You just get off and you can just go. Right. There's nothing stopping you from going immediately. So why don't they go immediately? And the only reason I can come up with is. Either A, they're crazy tired because they're weak or whatever, or B, they don't actually want to go. So what I can see is that there's a they're lot of people... They're not excited to go. I guess, it, and, I, and I realized the same thing when I was a kid. I've kind of put it all together now. When I was a little kid, me and my brother and my family were pretty hardcore about going to amusement parks. Like, if we were there, our goal was to ride the most number of roller coaster runs possible in the course of the day. Because, mm-hmm. you know, I paid like 70 whatever bucks to be there. I'm going to be there the, the second that park opens. And at 11.59, mm. before they shut off the line, I'm the last motherfucker yeah. in line. We were not that hardcore, but we did show up as soon as it fucking opened in the morning. We were there when the door gates were allowed in. We went on as many things as we could in general. Now, you know, sometimes, you know, we didn't you, run, no, but, you know. Sometimes you, we'd only run <laughs> for the first ride, but like you back it off a little bit. You take some lunch. You know like I, mean? I remember going going to Universal in the morning, right? Where they sort of let people into the park slowly and basically you can't go past this guy. So the guy is there. When I've been op- there with that guy. You, the guy is standing there when they open the gates. You walk in, but you're not allowed past the guy. And the guy slowly walks through the park and as he walks past a thing, that thing is now open. And then you can go on that thing. So of course... As soon as he passes, like Back to the Future, which was the craziest popular thing at the time. That was a good ride. We just go right in. And that was, you know, so, but we weren't like running to go on every roller coaster. Yeah. Well, you know, not, I'm not <laughs> saying running hardcore, but m- when I was at the amusement park, I had a mission. Oh, I yeah. had a goal. There were missions. I was there for fucking roller coasters. We did and- not, any every ride and everything we wanted to do, we did. We did not miss any things and we were doing things almost the entire time we were there. So when I was uh, older and I started going to Cedar Point and other amusement parks on my own, you know, with a car. Same, same policy. So, yeah. So I had and that even policy. more hardcore because there's no family weighing you down. No, are you kidding? My family was possibly more hardcore than me. Okay. So <laughs> we were, we were, that was our thing. It was our jam. But, you know, I'd go with friends from like high school and... The first time I went with a bunch of high school friends, we get in and I go to be fucking hardcore. And one other guy with me is also ready to be fucking hardcore. And everyone else is super slow. And they're like, oh, let's get breakfast before we ride a ride. Why so you can do you vomit it up, God, pussy. Man, man, man. So we, I look at him and I was like, fuck you guys. This was my brave heart moment. <laughs> I was like, all right, listen up, everybody. Because we were, we were like 15 of us there. You guys who aren't here for serious business roller coasters, you don't want to learn the fullness of it. You don't want, you don't care enough. You're not hardcore. You go do your bullshit. But if you're a man, stand with me. And like five or six of them came with me and we hardcored it all day. Of course. We were, we were literally <laughs> the last people we, and I time because I've been going to Cedar Point my whole life. So I'd like timed it at the end. Like we got food, like chicken fingers. Like everyone had two baskets of chicken fingers. It cost fingers. 20 bucks, but they only took one minute to eat. Yep. <laughs> and then, no, we got them. And then we got in line. We were the last people mm-hmm. in line in the longest line for the biggest roller coaster at the end of the night. That's right. So we were in that line for another two hours eating our chicken wings and just having an awesome time dance party. We we're the last motherfuckers on that roller coaster other than like the staff. He's letting everyone cut you. <laughs> <laughs> So you can. And at the end of the night, 
the guy, everyone I was with kind of turned to me and they were like, Rim, you're the god of Cedar Point. <laughs> okay. I was very proud of that moment. It's the same thing. These people, they're not hardcore about skiing. Now, you don't have to be hardcore about everything you do. But it's like they go, they take all the trouble to travel all this way to be at a ski Maybe resort. Maybe they live next door and they're just like, whatever. Uh, a lot of them are from New York. I could overhear their conversations. The mountains in New York, and everyone, almost everyone there is from New York. New York City. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that they're they're there to ski because they enjoy skiing, just like someone who's at an amusement park enjoys amusement parks, or just like someone who's playing Candyland likes Candyland. But they're not. They're scrubs, basically. They're not interested in ever getting beyond. Like they've achieved minimal basic proficiency at a thing. Enjoy the thing to a degree, but have literally zero interest in moving at any point beyond that initial proficiency. So they show up, they go to the top, they do the same blue square, simple course every time. And this is why Call of Duty is the big game and not Quake. Yep. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, it's gaming day. Yeah, I don't really have any news, but I do want to talk about NS2 because during my little vacation here, because I have a lot of days off between, you know, pretty much every day off between uh, Christmas and New Year's, uh, I'm not going back to work until after MAGFest pretty uh, much. M maybe one day. Uh, uh, um, I've been playing a lot of NS2 when I'm not, you know, the rest of the day I'd spend doing anti-shit talk, but during the times when I'm not anti-shit talking... You know, we're kind of... Uh, sliding into two separate courses right now because I've been doubling down on the Counter-Strike. No, I'm doing NS2 big time. And what I started doing is I have a new policy. And the policy is games of NS2 get ruined a lot when no one gets in the comm chair right away. So my new policy is I get in the game. If no one gets in the comm chair of either team, whatever my team is, in five seconds... I get in. And it's I not a bad it. policy because, you know, even if, you know, before, you know. And sometimes they'd be like, anyone doing it? Uh, I guess I'm doing it. Because if no <laughs> one else will do it, no one has the right to complain if I right. fuck up. As a result, I've done it a lot, and uh, which is kind of annoying because I don't want to do it a lot, but I just, my policy, I keep doing well, it. Well, there's been a lot of nubs lately. There are a lot of nubs because of the Steam sale. Uh, but I've learned a lot of things commanding. Number one, there's not too much micro like there is in StarCraft, so I can actually fucking do it. Two, because I know what the, because I played NS for so long I, that I know what you should do, like in terms of strategy and build order and all that, I'm not bad at it. And three, because I beat the StarCraft II single player campaign on normal, even though I still could not beat anyone in StarCraft II who knows how to play it, uh, I got the skills of using those RTS keyboard shortcuts and such uh. so I can actually build things quickly. Now, here are some observations. Observation number one. If your players ask for something, it is very likely that you are clicking on that thing at that exact moment, right, as they talk. For I can't tell you how many times I wish I had a dollar for every time someone said, hey, can I have spores? And I'm, I already had the thing open. I was clicking on spores at that second, <laughs> right? Hey, can we get armor too? And it's like I'm clicking on the arms lab as I hear this guy saying, can he get armor too, right? You must be psychic. That happens all the It's like, well, I think it's just because the players know when the thing should be ready in terms of how much res you have. They can see how much res you have. They know you have an arms lab. They see they have armor one, right? And it's like, yeah, I see the same thing they see. So if they were the calming, they would be clicking on armor two at the same time, right? So, yeah. so it's like they're backseat calming, but we have the same mind because we have the same data. The same hive mind. <laughs> right. Uh, something else I've noticed, right, is, you know, people always be complaining about balance this and balance that, right? You know, this is OP, that's OP. Here's what I notice. The only thing, really, that de there are two things that determine who will win a game of NS2, as, as I see it right now. Number one... Is your comm doing the job, right? If the basic the, job, right? Like, if they the build the right resource well, right. towers. If the comm fucks up, it doesn't matter what the players do, you will lose, right? The comm can lose the game for you, but the comm cannot win the game. There is nothing the comm can do to just be like, boom, we're losing, I'm bringing us back. It's like, no, if you're losing, you're going to lose, right? If the comm is doing the job properly, he enables victory. He make, creates the possibility of winning or guarantees losing, if the, assuming the other team hasn't also fucked up big time, right? Um, I gotta admit, some of my favorite games of NS are where the two comms are both incompetent and the game is just turned into some really weird clusterfuck. <laughs> that doesn't happen, ever. <laughs> I've, I've run I've, into I, games I, where I that haven't happens. seen it happen all week. Uh, but the comm can enable victory by comming mostly properly, right? If the comm does the job mostly right, the victory is possible. 
the, what makes the victory happen, what determines whether the win, assuming both comms do it do it properly, right? What determines who wins and loses is FPSing. That's yep. pretty much all that matters. If the Marines go out and when they're de- building a res tower, if they kill all the skulks who come to bite it and then move on to the next tower and kill all the skulks who come to bite that one, guess what? Now the commander has two more towers and probably a we second We need a stat chair. for this. It has to be something like, what's the ratio? Like, how many skulks can one of your Marines take out on his own? Right. If, you know... Like, if it's one to three, like, if one Marine can take out three simultaneous skulks, that, that alien team's done. Yeah, if a Marine goes out and he's building a res tower and he gets bitten, and then the second wave of Marines go and barely rescue that RT, well, guess what? You know, you think, oh, it's just one RT, it delayed you by one spawn wave whatever no it means the aliens now have their infestation in that tech point that's right behind that first rt because most of the maps go you know rt you know hive tech point rt rt hive tech point rt right so by failing at that first rt next to your base which is where the skulks will be because the skulks don't have to freaking build anything right they're running straight for that shit (laughs) um you know uh, you're losing that position after it by not pushing hard enough out there, and now you're set back. And all that had nothing to do with the commander. All he did was press S and build the RT for you, right? It's because you couldn't kill the skulks. You got bit. I'll admit I've been in situations where, you know, I've just failed, and you hear the commander be like, no, guys, stop dying. Oh, no. Right, now here's the no. thing that I didn't, you know, so much realize, and this is the final point, right, is being the commander of the team that loses, which I have done somewhat often. Uh, 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 I've also been commander of quite a few teams that just dominate so hard that we're pretty much all over. We just take over the whole map almost immediately, which is (laughs) almost also equally less fun. But being the commander of the losing team is like being angry Hitler. (laughs) <laughs> it's just like you know oh send in the troops from the, oh they're dead <laughs> well guys push e- push east god damn it well this is like, easy what the fuck guys stop going to go. <laughs> i've yeah. given you, i've built the last four shotguns god uh sir yeah, the shotguns all the are guys all gone. in cafeteria are dead it's uh, what the, every cycle <laughs> it's just like <laughs> it's just being angry there's nothing you can do there's no buttons you can press in that command interface to suddenly make your team be able to fucking aim or bite or whatever they need to do. I think at that point, all you can do is admonish your own players for their failure. That's pretty much what you do. Um, but yeah, oh, the all the, the other thing that's really bad is if your players don't listen, I just quit the server. I've had like two games where the guys were just like assholes. <laughs> and they really? Just, yeah, they were just trolling on whatever server it was and they just kept pushing the other way and I was like, guys, we, would, we had three res to the left. We lost all of them because you guys kept going to the right even though I said, use the phase gate. The only one guy built that phase gate. He built all that stuff on the left side of the map and then he died. He was one guy. He was awesome. And then we lost all that stuff on the left side of the map and all you guys kept going right even though I repeatedly said, go left go left and you said fuck you commander we want to go right to where the alien hive is right there and there's a pile of skulks biting you and you're getting killed constantly huh we could have taken the left side they didn't want to so i I just so i just quit i wonder what will drive that kind of trolling behavior yeah it's pretty pretty rare it only happened twice in multiple days but but uh, i never i never remember it happening in ns1 so i wonder it was rare no what i'm (laughs) saying i wonder if there's a slightly different mechanism design going on well in the one game i think it was one guy on the team was a bad egg and he was uh enabling and (laughs) and encouraging (laughs) he was egging him on yeah he was encouraging the bad behavior by the other players (laughs) (laughs) he evolved into an asshole he he was like fuck you commander we're going right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right so on the other side of that coin you know i set up our geek knights counter-strike server you guys haven't been using it too much i haven't been using it at all so get your shit together if you guys want me to keep paying for it because i might just shut it down because i have a clan server that i play on i when- predicted this would not you would not get enough players i know I was but right. it was so cheap but basically i've learned a lot one by playing uh, on uh, the, you know playing a lot of games with really good clanny people in Counter Strike Go, and I've got I've become a much better Counter Strike player as a result. My Counter Strike has probably gone downhill. My <laughs> NS has gone way down, so we're we're on equal sides of the same sinking boat at this <laughs> point. But uh, that stuff aside, running a server. I've realized now why it's such a pain in the ass and why so many people use these services and don't just run them themselves. You can just run it yourself. 
90% of the actual configuration and functionality is undocumented. Oh, yeah. It is documented solely in bullshit, mostly not correct forum posts and, and crappy way wikis. out of date wikis. Yeah, way out of date wikis is right. The other part of I that, know that wiki. is that, sure, you could figure it all out. But actually, stuff changes a lot, especially now with Counter-Strike Go. Like, they'll just change something in the master config, and then your server breaks, and there's no way to figure out how to fix it. <laughs> and I've been wrestling with that a lot, and it's a giant pain in the ass, and I know why this is the case. It's pretty simple. There's some hardcore motherfuckers who are willing to do all the work to make their own Counter-Strike servers stay up. And there's a bunch of official ones, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't plan any official ones because they. Okay. I actually don't use any of the official matchmaking or anything anymore. I just mm. go on the two clan servers and my own server because I know they're good. I know there's good people there. Mm. What if they're full? If they're full, I don't play. Okay. My server's never full. <laughs> That's true. Sometimes it's Why full. Why are you paying for it? Because it's so cheap. <laughs> but those people will keep those servers going and spend a ridiculous amount of time in their lives making them work and well, that's making them work thing. well. They got a clan. That's, that's serious exactly. business for them. And Valve wants the latitude to change things whenever they want. If they actually maintain documentation as to how the server they really works... They have to maintain worked, the documentation. Yes, and I know how this kind of product works because <laughs> I've managed several similar No one products. likes updating documentation. No, I'm pretty sure there isn't documentation. The documentation is the code and probably some text files related to the code. Maybe. And the... and The, the comments in the config file. And the config files are pretty much self-documenting if you understand what's going on on the undocumented back end. If you understand Quake 1 language, console now, commands. It'll slowly crystallize, I'm pretty sure, because they're, you know, right now, like, for example, here's something. Say they add a new map. Mm. Well, there's this complicated it's bullshit. It's not going to go into your map rotation automatically, right? Oh, that's, a, oh, oh, oh. that's a text file. No, it'll make your server not work anymore. Why wouldn't it? It's just, it just, you, all you did was add a, if there's a new map and you run the Steam updater, all it should do is put a new BSP file no, no, in no, the no, map no, no, folder. No, 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 So there's a complicated structure now where there's, there's master config files that you should never edit, mm. but you can edit them. You oh. should. Mm -hmm. Now, the way you make changes is you make, uh, like that same file, like underscore server, and you just, override things in that file. Mm, I know that pattern. Yeah, yeah so like That's variables and stuff. That is a good pattern, but they have this other, within the main config, they have this meta structure for map groups that is way, way, way overcomplicated. It's not just BSP files? No. So all these different variables have to be set for different maps, and you set a map group. A map group consists of a type and then a number of maps within that type, but a map group can also consist of other map groups. Oh, this is how it. So this is how it separates, say, demolition from CS from yes, FY, or classic from all maps, or uh, offline with bots from these maps don't support bots, uh. and it's a tree that seems to loop back upon itself a couple of times. It sounds pretty much just like a diagram, and it changes pretty often. Yeah, and the problem with it is that if there is any structural problem at all like something the whole does, server won't work yeah the whole server just won't work in really difficult to diagnose ways like the the there's way no it, log file there's no standard error output from uh, the server. i don't really have easy access to that because the kind of oh, hosting because i use the hosting thing don't yeah they, don't, but don't isn't that what you're paying them for to take care of that bullshit for you yeah so they do eventually fix that stuff but they're really slow at it oh they don't do it immediately as soon as the no. things up so pretty much anytime the counter-strike server is down it's probably because there's an update that hasn't been pushed to my server yet. You got to wait like three or four days. That three, four days downtime. Yeah. Do you have to pay for those three, four days? Yeah. I would fucking complain. I'd be like, hey, yeah. you guys didn't. I pay for this. Yeah, you know what? You didn't get my server. My server was down for three, four days. Fuck you. No, because I could fix it myself by getting the files manually and pushing them via FTP. And but what am I paying for? If I don't know how to do that, then I don't need to pay for your hosting. I'll just use someone else. I'll just use regular you know, Linux virtual hosting. No, because the Linux virtual hosting is more of a pain in the ass. <laughs> Even more of a pain? Because in the very least, these guys, if I just use their default shit, it'll work most of the time. I've gotten Counter-Strike servers just running most of the time. Yeah. On you know, just a Linux machine. Yeah, try getting Counter-Strike Go to continue to run with updates. 
Uh, you have to just restart it whenever there's updates. Nope. That you have to restart it and pull down the new master config files so and thing probably is, change I, some bullshit. When I run servers, though, the thing I love, I, I always keep default everything. I don't change anything at all. I'll, I don't put any weird mods or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, but you know what default... So what I would just do is if that was really a problem, if restarting the server didn't fix it with his updates... I would just delete the whole server and reinstall it with like a little script every single time so they would be completely fresh. Yeah, but then you like the, the whole reason we have our server and like the good clan servers and everything is they'll do basic stuff like remove Dust 2 from the rotation because fuck that map. Uh, or I love, you know, I'm sick of it. I like, I mean, yeah, but I mean. Or more importantly, for example, leave friendly fire on, but like what my server, what I did. It's is one I, line in a text file. I cut the number of lines down, of uh, numbered lines. I cut the number of uh, rounds in a match in half. So you have a faster rotation and I changed, and I changed all these sort of timer things like buy time and all these things and set the map. What's rotation wrong with such. the default ones? Uh, then a competitive match takes a couple hours. Sometimes what? it can take up to 90 minutes. I've had some NSs go 90 minutes, but most of them take 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, but Counter-Strike, you start to lose players. And I'd re for our players and our demographic, I'd rather have 15 rounds and then switch to a new map mm. with a winner. Yeah. One team won. It encourages much more goal-based play. Mm. But so I want some aspects of casual and some aspects of competitive. And then there's the bot configs. So I basically have to merge the casual and competitive together into my own thing. Mm. Anyway, the reason it's a pain in the ass is because it's undocumented. It'll probably never be documented because there's no reason to document it. <laughs> okay. It'll stop people like me from almost complaining. Let's move on. So, things of the day. I had a thing of the day. I know none of you assholes had seen it because it was relatively I can. Obscure. I got two things of the day, so I can... I can cover for you they're both well this, well this thing i don't want i would normally save one but they're both christmas so. oh okay mine is not christmas at all so you know the hobbit movie came out and there's the scene where they're getting Hobbitses. where the elf is like oh this is glandring the foe hammer and this is orcris the, the goblin cleaver and all that stuff mm -hmm. i never see that was one thing I, I forgot to mention right orcris is a really fucking lv sword which makes sense because it's an lv sword yeah you know but it's like i never thought of it as an lv sword so seeing it uh... and seeing it as the style of of LV Sword from Lord of the Rings, it was like, oh, that's a, that was an interesting choice to make it that style of sword when, for example, Narsil is, you know, the other kind, even though it was also made by elves. Yep, well, Glamdring, the faux hammer. So <laughs> I found this video just randomly, and it only had like 11 or 12 views. Okay. And basically it was that scene from The Hobbit where he's describing the names of the things. And he's like, and you know how he kind of unsheathes Glamdring and then sheathes it again? Yep. So you know that mashup style where someone will just take a thing and cut to other people reacting like or uh, Porky or uh, not Porky Porkins screaming forever before he dies. Okay. So they did that with that scene. So it was like, and this is Glamdring, the faux hammer, faux hammer, faux hammer, faux hammer. Yeah. Okay. And it cut around. It was really well done in terms of the cuts and everything. So this goes on for like two minutes and I'm kind of, I'm giggling a little bit. Emily's like, this isn't that funny. And she's not laughing. And then at the very end, he stops. He's like, faux hammer. Ah, and Orchrist, the faux hammer. And then it ends on that. <laughs> <laughs> and Emily even laughed there. Orchrist is not the faux hammer. <laughs> it was so well done. All right, so his two but things. It's gone. It got takedowned, and it's gone. I can't find it. Uh, so instead, I link to you the original Glamdring, the faux hammer. Sure. Okay, so here we go. This one's really quick. You know the Chipmunks Christmas song? You know, where they're like, uh, he wants a hula hoop. I think we already did this as a thing of the day years ago. Did we? Yeah, you can do it anyway. This was posted on, oh yeah, uploaded in 2008. But anyway, someone slowed this it. This was definitely a thing of the day. Oh, okay, well then it's a fall callback thing of the day then. Yeah. Because it came up again and I forgot it. They freaking slowed it down so all the other parts sound like they're slowed down. But all the sped up, you know, but the uh, the chipmunk parts sound like normal, like a barbershop guys singing chipmunk song yeah i've heard this also totally look at this fake album cover look at simon he's so <laughs> oh my god it's simon <laughs> he's the just faux hammer <laughs> <laughs> all right so anyway here's my real thing of the day that's not a redo all right this is uh gary gygax you know who gary gygax is He's better creator of DD. he would get christmas cards from friends everyone who sent him a christmas card got this note in reply and this note is interesting for several reasons reason number one 
because, you know, D&D was sort of hated as being satanic for a long time, but Gary Gygax is way Christian, right? And number two, he was also way rules lawyer. <laughs> Let me read to you. I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, I'm unfamiliar with this thing. Yeah, Gary Guy, I guess, would send this note to anyone who sent him a Christmas card. I'm going to read the whole thing, even though it takes a little while. All right. It's worth it. Gary Gygax thanks all his friends who sent Christmas cards. Being a Christian, he does not celebrate this holiday because, colon, one, the Bible does not command Christians to keep a festival on the birthday of Jesus Christ. Always one of those guys. Galatians 4, colon, 9 through 11. And what's C-O-L? Uh, I don't know. C-O, whatever call is, 2, 16 and 17. Two, the Bible does command that the followers of Jesus refrain from having anything to do with pagan religious celebrations. First Corinthians 10, 14, Acts 15, 20, second Corinthians 6, 14. Three, Jesus was not born in December, but sometime in the autumn. Check your religious or secular encyclopedia in parentheses. <laughs> Four, the, quote, holy day, Christmas, was not celebrated by early Christians. Parentheses, check sources indicated in three above. Five, numerous pagan rites have historically been held at this time of the winter solstice, the best known being the pre-Christian Saturnalia of the Romans, and Christmas is simply an agglomeration of various pagan religious observances, sprinkled with a pinch of Christianity to, descri to disguise its true flavor, and certainly does not honor either God nor his son. For detailed information on any particular aspect of the above, contact Gary at 330 Center Street, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, 53147. So there you go. Rules lawyering and uh, Christianity from the creator of D&D. Not bad. Take that. And uh, don't send me Christmas cards either, but not for those reasons. Because I hate cardboard. I just, it's like wasted cardboard. Come on. You got something better than that. <laughs> Maybe send a digital one. I'll be less upset. So, in the meta moment, there might not be gig nights for a few weeks after this. Oh, boy. Why would that be? Well, we've got our uh, annual New Year's celebration extravaganza that we run at my apartment every year. Awesome. Then we were going immediately to MAGFest. Double awesome. And then I might be flying directly from MAGFest to Istanbul. Would be more awesome if I was going. Yeah, well, you could just go. Take time off. I don't have money. I'm already taking time off from MAGFest. Take more time off. Don't have more time off because you go to Australia. It's not that expensive. To f All right, we got to <laughs> ride. We're going to PAX Australia. Yeah, let's not do the far future meta moments. Let's concentrate on the MAGFest. We're going to be at MAGFest. This is the last pre-MAGFest episode. All our shit is on Friday, dog. The schedule is up. MAGFest is happening. Friday morning, we are doing uh, the ethics of get video games, uh, two me or video game genres, and our own lecture, Beyond Candyland, which we've rewritten. Then we're going to play a fuck ton of games. Oh my God, of I'm the playing arcade so many games. And table varieties. I'm so excited about MAGFest. It is my second favorite convention that is not PAX. I, I, what's better than MAGFest that's not APAX? I had to leave Wiggle Room in there just in case. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is my the convention where I have the most fun times that is not a PAX. It's also a different vibe from PAX. Much more chill in oh, terms of... 24-7, four days that, gaming. Oh. In that there is awesome content, but I pretty much just want to dick around and play games with my friends and random strangers. And at PAX... The other bullshit that's going on is so great that anything I'm doing at PAX, yeah, I feel you gotta the spend, pang. You got to spend like an hour or two at a PAX going to the Expo Hall. There's I no feel Expo the Hall pang at of missing some other PAX thing at any PAX thing I'm doing. But at MAGFest, I don't feel like I'm missing anything because it's so long. Mm. Granted, PAX Prime is going to be four days, so... Yep. Yeah. And I think there is actually going to be uh, a Counter-Strike tournament at MAGFest. You better bone up. No. I'm not going to play in the Counter-Strike tournament. Me either. But I am going to play Counter-Strike, because playing Counter-Strike... Well, I think you need to bring your own PC for that, don't you? Uh, maybe. I don't remember anyway, if they had open whatever. PCs or not. I'm just saying. I played a bunch of Counter-Strike at PAX, though. Ah, uh, that was some awesome Counter-Strike at PAX. Something about land parties. Why did it... Why at PAX, you know, was I able to buy the, the you know, the what are this freaking awesome machine gun, the Nova, and just yeah. hose everyone down on Italy, just like literally hosing them down in the marketplace. <laughs> but when I go online, if I bring the machine gun and bring it to the market, 
second place and just get one headshotted. It makes because me, and that's what makes me think this cheating, but I nah, can't tell. I think it's just that we were drawing from a smaller. I mean, there aren't big as, fish, small pond. Yeah, the Counter Strike players in the world are not that many compared to well, say other things. Medium in the world. fish in the guppy pond at, at PAX, but medium fish in the we shark were the pond big fish at, on the internet in the transient pond from like 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. on. <laughs> Friday. Whereas if I go on the internet, I'm the medium fish in the shark pond. Basically. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, MAGFest, be there. Kineticon, panel submissions are open. We'll be scheduling things starting at the end of January, so submit soon. Yeah. The sooner you submit, the more likely I'll read your submission. Book club is... The Great Gatsby. And you should visit us on the internets, because you're not going to get any content from us in the podcast between now and... I might edit and together some of the video January shows. January sometime. Yeah, we've recorded ahead. We might record a little bit more video off and on, but... We're not going to speed up the video production unless you guys get more views on those YouTube videos. Yeah, so there's not going to be any new podcasts, but there may be videos, newsletters, and other sorts of things that you might enjoy. But you're not going to notice those things unless you follow us and go to our website and go to YouTube channels and go those places. And that said, Hotline Miami. All right. So I've enjoyed the shit out of this game. So this game, people were talking it up, right? And it was big Steam sale. I never heard of it. It just sort of came out of nowhere on the Steam sale for me. Not the new Steam sale, I had the heard, previous Steam sale. I'd heard buzz about it, but not from like the usual sources of buzz, but like people I knew would tweet like something, I, something Hotline right. Miami. I saw some tweets, and then I also saw some forum posts. So I picked it up for way cheap, and I... You know, but it was then after I did that, I found out it was mad crash. No, I think I found it was mad crashy and buggy before I got it. And then I was like, well, I'm going to bite the bullet for everyone else. So I got it. And of course, it was mad crashy and didn't work. So I told everyone, fuck this shit. Doesn't work. Fuck. And then they got their shit together. And a week later, they patched it a whole bunch. And I noticed it kept getting updated on Steam. <laughs> so then I played it. And I played it on my HTPC because it felt like an HTPC Robotron kind of game. And now I'm not so sure if it, if I should play with the gamepad or the mouse and keyboard. It's like either way I mouse go. Mouse and keyboard. I tried with both. I think the game is better with mouse and keyboard because... It's not perfect either way. No. Nah, well, the thing is, with mouse and keyboard, it feels like the game was designed with that in mind. Mm -hmm. Because it the fact that there's a crosshair gives you a ridiculous degree of precision when it comes to using projectile weapons. True. And planning things out. And I... I feel like I was much better at the game with the mouse and keyboard, despite the somewhat janky uh, Im implementation of WASD. And when I tried with the gamepad, I just couldn't fucking kill anybody. Well, I was slightly better, but the thi for, the for example, with the mouse and keyboard, there are some things I can do better. For example, I'm in a room, and you know there's a guy coming at me. I need to quickly aim at different guys. Much easier with the mouse, right? But the gamepad actually allows you to lock onto a guy. Like lo like Zelda, like lock on, Metroid lock on. Uh, so, I don't like lock ons though. Well, no, but what this lets you do is, for example, there's a room and there's one guy in it, for right? And uh, he's just sitting on the couch. I lock onto him before I go in the room. Then I just open the door and like throw a baseball bat at him. But see, I feel Immediately. like, so that, I that's, like that's like aimbot. Right, it is. So I can't, it's part of the game though. So you can't possibly miss while doing that. Ah, but, so but it you makes say, it so certain situations you can execute more efficiently. So if there was some way to switch between the two controllers. But you, say, you, you say it's part of the game. It is, but it is in the sense that lock-on is like the go-to number one first gimpy thing you do if you take a game that was designed for mouse and keyboard and port it to a gamepad. Yep. But this is, you actually have to press a button to lock on. It's not just like an auto aim. Oh yeah. Most games have the button press for auto lock on. Right. But it's, at it's... the same time, I feel, I don't know. I feel like <laughs> the game flows better when you don't have that. Cause then it's much more frantic. It was, it's frantic no matter what. All right. So let's, 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 so what the game is, there's a weird sort of, theme to the game. I'm not going to talk about that right now. I like the theme. I'll yeah, say that. But it basically what it is is you're this dude and you go into a level and you have to kill everybody without dying. And you die in one hit pretty much. If yes, anything but touches you, you die. Super Meat Boy thing of if you die, just try again. Just yeah, try again. Try you can again, just try, try again, again infinity times. And it's a Robotron game. Direct top-down view and you walk around with one, you know, and then you move, you aim with the other in any of the directions. And you know, you can pick up any weapon that anyone drops. Normally you have fists. And if you hit a guy with fists, he doesn't die. You have to actually get on and, and sort of bash his head in, right? And then you take people's weapons and you can use the weapons. If you hit someone with a weapon, they die. But if you shoot a gun 
right? That's obviously the most efficient way to kill a lot of guys, but it makes noise, which attracts more guys to come out of the woodwork. Normally, it's like Hero Quest, where they won't go through doors, and they'll just sort of follow patterns. So you can, you know, each level is sort of like a puzzle you have to solve. Which guy do I kill first? Which room do I go in? I need to kill a guy first to get a weapon. Then I can kill these guys quietly, but then there's so many guys in that room, I'm going to have to use an assault rifle, which will wake up these guys. And you, you plan out each level through trial and error and, and, you know, walking around to eventually figure out the way to kill all the guys without getting killed. And then you need to execute it because it is fast. But it is really fast. Now, what's very important here is they're very minimalist top-down 2D game, but the aesthetic and the music drive... The music is really good. The music is so pumping and so rhythmic and it just... And the style and the aesthetic, it feels like it's almost one of those, like, it's a deconstruction of an ultra-violent, like, late 90s sort of film noir throwback action movie. Yeah, it's what it's it's pretty psychedelic uh, in its styling. It's, it's like one of those weird, trippy crime movies where, you know, uh, what was that one where we didn't watch the beginning part of it? Oh, I don't remember. On the DVD, we yeah. skipped the part. Yeah, with, uh, Keanu Reeves. Yeah, what on the was bench. that movie called? It's sort of like that a little bit, but maybe a little more neon, <laughs> a but little more criminal. The music pumping, the way it basically drives you to get this sort of like flow in the game, where it's like kick the door, throw the bat at the dude while you're waiting to punch the dog that you know is going to come around the corner. You can't punch dogs. Oh yeah, you can't. Right. Although I think you can if you take the punching mask. Oh, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I only ever wore Don Juan, the horse mask. The horse mask, I think, is my favorite mask Because the, the horse mask basically meant a lot of times what I would do in a map if I was having trouble is I'd go get a gun, and I'd back up near a door. I'd fire that gun once, and I'd stand just so on the door, and the door just became a murder machine, and I'd just wait. Yeah, because basically, here's that, when you, if there's a door, you basically touch the door, and it opens. And if there's a guy on the other side of the door, he gets knocked down. He doesn't die. He just gets knocked down. And if he has a weapon, he drops it. If he has a weapon, he drops it. So that gives you a chance to jump on him and bash his head in quietly, or kill other people in the room while he's lying down, and then kill him. So if a room has two guys, and one of the guys is next to the door, that's a really good situation. You knock the guy down with the door. You you kill the guy who's still standing really quickly before he kills you. Then you kill the guy on the ground. Really simple. If there's three guys in a room, that's when you start to have troubles. Um, but if you get the horse mask, every time you start a level, you can choose a mask, right? Which gives you one special power. And as you get farther in the game, you get more masks to choose from. The horse mask means if you hit a guy with a door, he dies. So what you do is if you shoot a door with a gun, the door swings back and forth because it just got shot with a powerful gun. If that door hits someone, they die. So you just get guys to go through a door, trick them into it, and keep shooting the door with your gun, and it flaps back and oh, forth. Oh, I wouldn't shoot the door with a gun. I'd stand next to the door going, ba-bam, 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 just bumping into it. Oh, like that? Because oh, then, because because eventually... I shoot the door with the gun, because then it goes... <laughs> like a little, you know, like... And just, it, it's literally like a wood chipper for any guys that run into it while the gun is firing. Now, the game gets increasingly, it really does a good job of teaching the player the skills necessary to tackle increasingly complex and dangerous maps. Mm -hmm. And they're all different. Some of them are super stealthy. Like, you go room by room, like, kill everybody in the room. Go to the next room, kill everybody. Some of them, like, you walk in, there's a guy immediately at the door, like, trying to kill you. Yeah, I hate that when they, there's some of the levels where it's like, start, and it's like the door, you just open the door and a guy runs at you immediately. It's like, fuck you. One of those maps, one time. It reminds you of those times. It door. reminds you of those times when you save state with the bullet coming at you. <laughs> so you're like load dodge. Though there's one of those maps where what I did because I couldn't get past it is I opened the door to the outside and the guy sees me and then I ran back before it like locked me in. Yep. And I ran off into the you know the the uh, neon BS outside. Mm -hmm. And then the guy came and I killed him and took his gun, fired a shot, and then everyone in the building starts running outside and I shot them all one by one. Nice, <laughs> nice. I pretty much only use the horse mask or the unicorn. Yeah, I use the, the unicorn unicorn's to take okay. out, I use the unicorn to take out the cops. The uh, you know the giraffe isn't bad unless you see really far, so you can plan out better. So what you can do is you can do a level with the giraffe to sort of scope it out, then quit, load, continue, go back into the level with the horse. Except after a lot you, of times I'd you know scope it out by not going in and walking around the whole building once first. Maybe. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I'm talking about like the second part of it, right? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Third, second, we go up the elevator. I just fucking went for it. Some, I, mean, I got so, the game teaches you so well that by the end of the game, I was just like a murder machine. Like I would walk yeah. through a level just killing 
everybody with almost no trouble. Yeah, it's it's only when this, sometimes they give you a tricky part. It's pretty much like most of a level is well, easy. Well, when I die, it always be because, like, it, it, it's like Mega Man. If I die, it's because I fucked up. Right, but it's like every level will have one or two tricky parts. So it's pretty much like you're waiting patiently at the tricky part, and as soon as you get past that, hose down a bunch of guys real easily, go around murdering, 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 and then, up oh, tricky part, get it just right. Oh, I fucked it up. Start or again. Or when, when a new element gets introduced. Like, at one point, there's there's the, like, the heavy set black dude. I hate that guy so much. Oh, my God. That guy scares the crap. Because one time, you way later in the game, You have to shoot right? him with a gun. Yep. You can't hit him with anything else. So way later in the game, right? I, uh, there's one of the big maps, and there's two of those dudes. Uh, and I killed one of them, and I, and I thought I killed the other one, but I guess I didn't. There's the one level where you go in, and there's immediately a guy with the two-shot gun. I hate the two-shot gun. I love that gun. It it's only fires two shots, and it's easy to just fire them both. by you know, the, yeah. So you get to take the two-shot gun from him, and then two of the big guys come in immediately. You have to shoot one, two, a boom, boom. So That's I the beat, only way to do it. I beat this whole gigantic map very methodically. I'd taken everyone out kind of stealthily. There was one room left with like two dudes in it, so I went and got a machine gun. I was like, I'm just going to kick in the door and just shoot them both. Because there's no one left to respond to the gun. So I kick in the door. I go, ba-bam! And I kill them both. And the, the stage clear doesn't appear. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, thought I killed everyone. Huh. So I'm like thinking, like, is there anywhere? And I'm like, is there a secret? Maybe there's a... Like, I didn't know. I've never been this level before. And out of nowhere, one of those black dudes just comes from nowhere and fucking kills me. Yeah. He must have been in the start of the map, and I just missed him. And he heard the gunshot and just came running all the way. It took him like 45 seconds to get to me. So he comes out of nowhere. I'm like, ah, and he got me. Mm. Hate that guy. I don't mind the detective nearly as much. The guy with the taser. No, that guy's not so bad. Except sometimes you'll shoot him. He'll like lunge forward and get you anyway. You gotta like shoot him and then back off. Nah. Uh, so how far did you get? I, I have, I've not beaten the game yet, but I'm at the. I got to the boss with the two Panthers, and I have not. Uh, I know how to beat him. I just haven't, and I've been playing Ennis instead. So. Wow, I beat him. He was actually the easiest. The thing is, at first, the Panthers were so easy. You just have to. It gives you an arrow that says, "Hey, pick up this trophy," and it's like, "Oh, duh, right." And then I would just like hide behind the big statue. It's like I couldn't figure out what to do with the ninja girl. And then eventually I tried throwing. And of course that worked. Yep. And then I had to beat the guy himself. So I, I went online and I saw that if you stand right next to him, there's a weird, it's not really a glitch. It's more just like poor programming. And that if someone has a gun, the bullets start at the end of the gun. If you stand right next to a guy, the barrel of his gun is actually starting behind you. So if, a, if you're right next to a guy who's shooting, he can't hit you. The bullets are basically starting behind your back. So I just grab a knife, get right up close to the guy, cut him off, cut him. Then I get a second knife, but then I get a third knife, I fucked it up. So whatever. Uh, but yeah, something that the thing is, there is stuff about this game that bothers me. It's one of those situations. Only one thing bothers a me. A few things bother the me. The game is crashy and glitchy as all fuck. Actually, those problems went away for me after some updates. Uh, so yeah, after the updates, the crashing stopped, but. On two maps, I would very often be knocked by an enemy out of the map with no way back in and no way to die. Oh, I haven't had that happen. That happened to me like five times. Okay. Uh, what bothers me is, number one, you know, the controls, we already discussed this a little bit. I like them. They're Yeah, I mean, and on paper they're right, but they're not, you know, really, you know, that accurate as they need to be for this kind of thing. It's so fast. They are accurate. The problem is you have to be precise with the thing that isn't entirely obvious to you. Why do you have to be precise with this not obvious to me? Like the like the, the hit boxes on the guys are not obvious. See the thing like that, you'll punch a guy and it'll miss him because he didn't actually hit his hitbox. Oh uh, that's also that does happen, yes. But the thing that bothers me is that if you're using the mouse and keyboard, right, the mouse isn't relative. It's sort of absolute. So, and the guy isn't always locked in the middle of the screen exactly. So, which, that, which I like because you have the cursor on the screen. No, no, no. Because then what happens is, you know, I'll have the mouse to the left of the guy aiming left. And yep. then I'll walk left. Suddenly, the, he'll, the gun will flip to the right because I walked past the cursor. It's like, no, no, no. I didn't move the mouse. See, I, like, I should still be aiming left. No, no. See, I like that because it's not aiming. I didn't think of it as aiming. I think of it as aiming. I it's thought of mouse. it as I had the crosshair, right? I was constantly hitting shift doing the far look like the entire I game. I was doing that also. And I always thought of the mouse as being absolute. That actually seemed very intuitive to nah, me. Yeah, it's, it's not. that's not the way a Robotron would be I did because it's not Robotron. It is Robotron. No, it's not. It is. It shouldn't be. It's Robotron. It's not Robotron. It is it's Robotron. Absolute, because I would absolutely click on a dude 
went like no. like it's fucking right Robotron. On a dude, no. when I was shooting at it, it's Robotron. Anyway, I think it's better not being Robotron. I think Robotron perfected it. That's why everyone calls it Robotron. Yeah, I'm saying this and game. The, no, this is not better than that. This I is, for this game, Smash I think D, it this is. Should, they should use the Smash TV controls and just had it be done. Anyway, the other thing that bothers me is that you know it's all about doing the level over and over again, like Super Meat Boy, until getting it just right. But unlike Super Meat Boy, the level is not 100% identical I every liked time that you read. I do not like that. If you want me to complete redo something over and over again until I get it just right, you need to have it be exactly pixely no. identical now, that to would the be previous the case. time that I did it, just like Super Meat Boy is. No, no, that would be the case if you're going for the ranking system, which I ignored. I don't care. Like I, ABC? I, I ignored that completely. Yeah, I ignored it I'm too. just saying is but I, I, wanna, no, I, like I came up with this, uh, a way to beat the level, and it works... <laughs> You know, five out of six times because the sixth time the level doesn't render and start See, the exact no, same way. Because Scott, the game that's bullshit. The game is not a puzzle game like that. It is much more an action game in that the dep like depending on where you stand and the tiny subtleties of you know like where you shoot the gun, different guys might hear it. Uh, their path might be altered slightly. Once a guy hears you once, his path changes. He might walk around a different room instead. I'm so much as the starting setup will not be the same. For example, there'll be a level with those big guys and you have to shoot one. And sometimes you'll start right next to a guy with a gun you can take. And sometimes you won't. And it's like, well, if you start with the neck and the guy with the gun isn't there to take and the big guys are going to come, you pretty much can't beat them. So just die and start again because the level started shittily. See, now that... That's why you see, need to have here, the level be exactly the same no, every time. because that one in particular, I played that level a ton of times. It was a different gun every time, but that first guy always, 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 without I've exception, had it, dropped a gun. I've had it. Start up, baseball bat. What are you going to do now? That never happened that to happened me in that to me. Now... I think I know why it was done this way, and I kind of like it. it lazy just programming? No. Yeah. No, I think Same it was... Same lazy programming that causes these fucking crashes? Why would it be lazy to be randomized as opposed to just hard-coded? Uh, I don't know. I think I it's much it. more simple. I think, what, I think the rationale is, because this is the rationale I would use for something like this, you could randomize the weapon, certain characters' weapons that you could get or weapon placements as a sort of mechanism for if a player can't beat a level, they might get a slightly different loadout after a few deaths that might, for that player, may be, make it easier for them. That is true. Because, like, I'm really good. If if I found a knife, for, I true. used the knife for the entire rest of the map. The knife was the best the weapon knife in the is game. really good, yeah. But the problem is, the lazy part would be, if you're going to do that, you need to identify which guns can be random and which ones based on the level have to be the same or else the level doesn't work Yeah, you anymore. might get, you know, that's the thing is I, I see where you're coming from on that, right? It's like I'm having a hard time, if the level is locked in and someone is having a hard time beating it it would be a Super Meat Boy, exactly where it's like, well, I can't really beat it and I'm getting the same shit every time and I don't know what to do So, but if it mixes it up, it's like, well I couldn't beat it the way it is that way, but I can beat it this way because I start off with the assault rifle instead of the baseball bat but why not just have the assault rifle one be the one it always is? Then you won't have that problem. There's going to be some configuration that's going to be the beatable one for most people, even if someone else might. See, have I guess I don't think it like it. It has the trappings of a puzzle game, but to me, it's really just an action game. Like I beat a lot of levels. Super Meat Boy is an action game, but it's also exactly the same. Yeah, it's a very different kind time. of game. It's. I think it's actually mostly. The same game as Super Meat Boy with these imperfections I've complained no, about. No, it would have to be but it'd have it's to be Robotron instead of platform. It would have to be completely rewritten to be that because this game, due to its glitchiness and all the kinds of just the way it was done, is very soft and fuzzy in the end. There's it's all you have to rewrite it to make it purely deterministic like you want. Well, I don't I think the other thing is, right? And Which was fine because I the pro, I mean you can beat most of the levels, if you're good enough, just by grab a gun and just run around fucking shooting everybody. Maybe. I've beaten... I, Ammo, ammo's an issue. No, because you keep picking up other guns. If you run out of guns, it doesn't matter. You that's can, Oh, that's something else that pisses me off, right? You're standing near a bunch of guns. The only button you have is pick up weapon. And you might pick up the gun you didn't want. So sometimes, if uh, you know, if it's quiet, I can sit there picking up all the guns to find the one that nah, still has ammo in it. No, I just fucking go for it. All guns are equal to me. No, what I'm saying is sometimes I'll sit there picking up guns until I find one that still has ammo in it. 
Nah. But if I'm standing there and there's like two empty shotguns and an assault rifle next to me, and I the only button I have is switch weapon. So you got to be smart about that shit. I would whenever I finished a mm. weapon, I would throw that gun off in the corner away from everything. Yeah. Else. Okay. And then I kill a guy who's in that corner. Then I go to go pick up his gun, but the bullshit gun, empty gun, is there. See, I never threw guns at people because I never needed to. This, this, you know, this situation's like this, I right? Know, I'm and the controls, yeah, the controls don't bother with that, and you can't. I was occasionally fucked by that and when it happened I got pissed off because it wasn't anything I did wrong it was this bullshit game See, I actually, didn't give me some means to indicate that I wanted to pick up the gun that had ammo and not the empty one I kind of enjoyed that I didn't have that, those means I don't enjoy getting fucked do you <laughs> like getting fucked Rim? because you're fucking <laughs> because I in this game I kind of you're not getting me the iPad like I could go through the entire game super methodically and puzzly but instead the game was basically pushing you at all points to just fucking go for it. Blah! And I found that whenever I just went blah and just picked up whatever gun and just started shooting, the game was a lot more fun. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah, you didn't get to the plot at all. Uh, well, I mean, there is some plot so far. Yeah, right? well, you're a psycho killer. Right, and you don't know why. But and there's that janitor. And there's a weird, a weird janitor looking at you, and... There's some Russian mafia involved, and I also hose down a whole police station, which is yeah. badass. I, ca- I liked how when you get to the top floor of the police station- And there's something weird there's going de- on at the bodega. There's that detective. Well, yeah, because suddenly the guy who's been with you the whole time is dead, and there's this asshole there now. Yeah. So there's the, the I like the detective who is talking to all the cops before you basically bust in Terminator 1 style and kill them all. <laughs> and he's just like... It is that totally Terminator 1. He's like, come on, guys. Just follow procedure and we'll get through this. We'll take out this crazy nut job. It's like, no, you're none of you are going home to your kids tonight. Well, yeah, you are actually 99 out of 100 times. But on the 100th time, none of you are going home to your kids Yeah, but even, even the times when, I, when they took me out... Most of them were not going home to their kids. I feel like every one of those cops was one day away from retirement. <laughs> That's why they were in the police station where they were safe, <laughs> behind all those security doors. What's that, XKCD? Man, it's a shame, too. We died one day before we were going to lock him in that room that we lock every cop in the day before retirement. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but yet, so this is a game, you know, and it's, it, the reason it's more So it's going to reveal something. Hmm? If, when you, if you beat that boss, yep. you get an ending. Okay. Pretty interesting ending. And then, then mo- there must be more game because there's so many not unlocked masks. Uh, so remember way back when you ran into someone else who had already killed a bunch of people? Didn't Wasn't he a boss and I killed him? Uh, yeah. So then you play the game again as that guy where that scene goes differently and you kill him. So you're him and you kill the you from the previous playthrough and it's a different timeline. Oh, okay. Where what if that dude killed the psycho killer and went off doing his own thing. So it's not the same So when timeline, you play as that a- guy, the biker dude, you have a you have like this meat cleaver that you can't drop and you have three knives you can throw and you can't pick up weapons. Mm. And there's no masks and the game's totally different. But how do I get the other half of those masks? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I ignored all that. I got the last mask. I unlocked, uh, I forget which one's the last one. I got a bunch of masks. I got one mask every level, so I don't know how to get the rest of I them. I got two masks in a couple levels. Oh, really? I picked, I found a mask on the ground and picked it up. Fuck. I fucked that I got up. the grasshopper guy. What does he do? I don't remember, because I only ever used the horse head or the unicorn. <laughs> That's right. Oh, uh, man. Yeah, but yeah, this is one of those things where the game is so good, right? But there, is some, there are these things that, at least, I guess they don't bother Rim, but they infuriate me. Well, the thing is, the game is rough and, the reason and they're unpolished, infuri- right. but I th- feel like... And that's like- the reason that it's infuriating, because if a game just sucks all around, the sucky things don't bother you because you just don't fucking play it. It's infuriating when there are flaws in an otherwise great thing because... It's sort of like a stain on a beautiful paint, right? It's like See, but to me, I, I guess mm-hmm. this is the, the, the point where I'll take form and function and form as function. And, you know, the idea that this game was unpolished and rough and had a lot of janky. And how that goes along with the plot and yes, aesthetic that, of it. That, that not just I do setting. agree, and I give that. That is to the game's benefit. It's, it also fits with the aesthetic. Like, the aesthetic of the game just really... Feel like those weird black sort of fly glitchy things flying around whenever the mask guys are talking to you, and the game's just weird. And I liked it because it was so weird and janky. Yeah, so you know it's cheap on the Steam sale right now, right? It, uh, you know what? We might have complained about it a little bit. 
It's five you should, bucks. You should play this game. This yeah. game is fantastic. For fucking five bucks, why would you not buy this game? Seriously. Five dollars. You probably spend more on lunch. And there really aren't other games like it. Yeah, I mean, there's some Robotrons out there, but the mo- game is- most of the Robotrons out there are like, what's that one, Alien something? Oh, this game is not anything like those games. It's not yeah. even, I can't call it a Robotron game because while it has similar controls, it's not like a Robotron game. It's like... Yeah, Alien Breed. Yeah, this is way better than Alien this Breed. Is, this is ultra violence, but in this sort of deconstructed way... Like, you're the bad guy, and you know you're the bad guy. You just said you had to experience this game, and for five bucks, there's no reason you shouldn't. Yeah, that's. You got 40 hours as of this recording to get it for five bucks. You should get it. It's probably going to be five bucks for a long time. You know, even if you have to pay the regular price of 10 bucks, get it anyway. Yeah. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.
Universal in the morning, right? Where they sort of let people into the park slowly, and basically you can't go past this guy. So the guy is there. When I've been there with that guy. You, the guy is standing there when they open the gates. You walk in, but you're not allowed past the guy. And the guy slowly walks through the park. And as he walks past a thing, that thing is now open. And then you can go on that thing. So, of course, as soon as he passes, like, Back to the Future, which was the craziest popular thing at the time. That was a good ride. We just go right in. And that was, you know, so. But we weren't, like, running to go on every roller coaster. Yeah. Well, you know, not, I'm not <laughs> saying running hardcore, but when I was at the amusement park, I had a mission. Oh, I yeah. had a goal. There were missions. I was there for fucking roller coasters. We did and not any every ride and everything we wanted to do, we did. We did not miss any things and we were doing things almost the entire time we were there. So when I was uh, older and I started going to Cedar Point and the other amusement parks on my own, you know, with a car. Same same policy. So yeah, so I had and that even policy. more hardcore because there's no family weighing you down. No, are you kidding? My family was possibly more hardcore than me okay so <laughs> we were we were that was our thing it was our jam but you know i'd go with friends from like high school and the first time i went with a bunch of high school friends we get in and i go to be fucking hardcore and one other guy with me is also ready to be fucking hardcore and everyone else is super slow and they're like oh, let's get breakfast before we ride a ride so Why you can you vomit it up pussy man, man, man. so I look at him and I was like, fuck you guys. This was my brave heart moment. I was like, all right, listen up, everybody. Because we were, we were like 15 of us there. You guys who aren't here for serious business roller coasters, you don't want to learn the fullness of it. You don't want, you don't care enough. You're not hardcore. You go do your bullshit. But if you're a man, stand with me. And like five or six of them came with me and we hardcore it all day. Of course. We were, we were literally the last people we... And I timed... Because I've been going to Cedar Point my whole life. So I'd like timed it at the end. Like we got food, like chicken fingers. Like everyone had two baskets of chicken fingers. It cost fingers. 20 bucks, but they only took one minute to eat. Yep. <laughs> and then, no, we got them. And then we got in line. We were the last people mm -hmm. in line in the longest line for the biggest roller coaster at the end of the night. That's right. So we were in that line for another two hours eating our chicken wings and just having an awesome time dance party. We're the last motherfuckers on that roller coaster other than like the staff. He's letting everyone cut you. <laughs> <laughs> so you can and at the end of the night, the guy that... It's Christmas Day, 2012. I'm Rim. I'm not Christian. <laughs> and neither am I. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, on this lovely Xmas, we are talking about Hotline Miami. <laughs> the least Christmassy. <laughs> the most Christmassy game there is. Let's, Let's do this. I was actually trying to think of if there are any Christmassy games. Hotline I, Miami. I, no, but like, I, like legitimately Christmassy games. And I could not think of any. The only things I could think of were games like Rise of the Triad, where if you play it on Christmas, then there's like Easter eggs because it looks at the date on your calendar. Huh. There probably are some crappy Santa-ish games. But... I'm sure, but can you think of a... Home Alone. I guess. Home Alone. I mean, Die Hard was an NES game. Yeah, Home Alone and Die Hard. <laughs> but I mean, can you think of legitimately Christmas themed, as in the theme is Christmas, not the theme is Home Alone, which is a Christmas movie, right? Games. So it's got to be the direct that, theme. That aren't just. So it can't be a game that, that aren't that just is about like throwaway shovelware, you know, or like flash games for marketing purposes or bullshit like that. Why doesn't someone just make, I'm sure they exist and they're all terrible. The tower defense equivalent, but more like the resource management game of Santa's got to deliver all the presents. You could, then that could not, that could be pretty good. Yeah, it could be pretty good. You have to plot Santa's route. You have to manage all the elves to make enough presents. You might come up short. Then you get to figure out which kids to short. So then you start federating Santa. And you play years at a time. <laughs> You know, one year, year one, year no, two. No, it's got to be like Sim, uh, not Sim City. S Sim Pole. No, it's got to be like Aerobiz, Sim where Elf. you start in like the there's 1890s. Competing, there's, com there's competing Santas. There's other uh, Santas. No, you're you're fighting against Krampus. <laughs> I feel like most people didn't know about Krampus, at least not in the U.S., but 
just in the last, like this year, for whatever reason, Krampus has come up. Like there's been a bunch of college humor videos about Krampus. Uh, Krampus has come up in a bunch of web comics. I feel like. You know what? It's not just you. This is the third time I've heard Krampus come up. Yeah. So why it came, did it come it came, up suddenly? It came up on the John Hodgman podcast. That's the first place I heard it. Why? Then I saw someone mention it in a comment on the internet. I'll and admit, you just said it now. This is the third the one. The reason it's been on my mind That's is since, three more Krampuses than I heard last year. Since Halloween, when uh, everyone except Scott went to Chase's house to watch. Uh, what do you mean? Kramp- <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's been all the Krampus Krampus has nothing to do with Die Hard, and neither one of those has anything to do with Taming. But they all came up on Twitter recently. Sure. My Twitter. Okay, great. Anyways, I was skiing today. You know, I, we've talked about skiing a little bit before. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an avid skier. I'm a... I'm not a professional skier. I don't do it as a job. I'm not ski patrol. You're I'm not, not a master either. I'm not the best skier You're in the world. You're not a master or a professional. But I am a really good skier. <laughs> like I'm a I'm a I'm a pretty good skier at this point. And having skied at Hunter Mountain and on the East Coast a lot in the last few years in particular, one what the fuck, dudes? Why do you show up to the mountain at, like, noon? It costs you the same. You ski, like, twice, and then you sit on your well, ass they don't at like the to top g- of the mountain for the rest of the day. You paid 70 bucks for that lift ticket. They don't, well, number one, why did they get there at noon? They don't like to get up early. Number two, why did they but sit on... But it closes at four. You already missed, you know... Four and a half hours of skiing. <laughs> Why do they sit at the top of the mountain? I have no fucking clue. I know. That would be like if you went up the water slide stairs, you got to the top, and they only let people go on the water slide one at a time. Now but you know imagine, why they do that. Imagine if, I, if everyone could go on the water slide at once, dude. If I got, why don't you kid, just go as soon as you got to the top immediately? If we were little kids and there wasn't that dude there with that minor authority over us. It would we would all die. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's skiing, you just get off and you can just go, right? There's nothing stopping you from going immediately. So why don't they go immediately? And the only reason I can come up with is either A, they're crazy tired because they're weak or whatever, or B, they don't actually want to go. So what I can see is that there's a they're lot of people They're not excited to go. I guess it, and, I, and I realized the same thing when I was a kid. I've kind of put it all together now. When I was a little kid, me and my brother and my family were pretty hardcore about going to amusement parks. Like if we were there, our goal was to ride the most number of roller coaster runs possible in the course of the day. Mm-hmm. Because you know, I paid like seventy whatever bucks to be there. I'm gonna be there the the second that park opens, and at eleven fifty nine before they shut off the line, I'm the last motherfucker yeah. in line. We were not that hardcore, but we did show up as soon as it fucking opened in the morning. We were there when the door gates were allowed in. We went on as many things as we could in general. Now, you know? sometimes you know we didn't you, you, run, no, but you know sometimes <laughs> we'd only run for the first ride. But like you back it off a little bit, you take some lunch. You know? Like I, mean, I remember going to university. Possibly the third best Christmas movie ever made, <laughs> Rare Exports, Okay, and which you should watch. I haven't heard of it. It is on the same level as Miracle on 34th Street. And, That's uh, okay. It's yeah, an okay movie. It's on that level of movie. The, of course, the black and white old one. Yeah. Not the... What? what? <laughs> that has remakes, you know. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, Let me look them up. Uh, uh at least we agree Die Hard is the greatest Christmas movie ever made. And who does not agree with that? And I think Tokyo Godfathers is up there. Maybe number, maybe number two, three, four. Two, top five, easily. That's right, it's up there. There's a whole bunch of top fives. So today, I went skiing. Okay, there is a... Hold on, just to clarify before you go on your skiing. The one we like is the 1947 film. <laughs> there is <laughs> a 1973 and a 1994 remake. Why? Well, I guess I know why. The 1973 was a TV movie remake, and the 94 one was a movie theater remake. All right, Scott. Which is better, Miracle on 34th Street or The Nightmare Before Christmas? Uh, As a Christmas movie. As a well, then I had to say Miracle on 34th Street only because, <laughs> only because, not to say that it's better than Nightmare Before Christmas, but because Nightmare Before Christmas is also a Halloween movie. All right, all right, it all is, right. It is only half a Christmas movie. Miracle on 34th Street or It's a Wonderful Life? It's a Wonderful Life is way better. Okay, I, not even we close. Agree. We agree. It's a Wonderful <laughs> Life or Die Hard? <laughs> it's uh, well, Die Hard. Is it's a an affirmation, just making sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, unrelatedly, I think it was Pork Fry tweeted, you know, talking about synchronicity. You follow here. Pork Fry? I follow Pork Fry. Okay. Recently, I fo- for whatever reason, Twitter was like, hey, you should follow Pork Fry. And I was like, oh, I kind of know that guy. Does people listening know who the hell Pork Fry is? I don't know. 
<laughs> so I follow him now, and he randomly was like, our tradition is to watch Die Hard every Christmas. And Why was, wouldn't it be? But we were just talking about Die Hard. And then after that, there were two posts, two tweets by two people who don't know each other. They're not even the same spheres of the world. Mm-hmm. They're just two people. How could you tell? Because I just, I, they're two people I know independently. Okay. And they both tweeted within a few seconds of each other, and they had the word tamed in their tweets. One of them was talking about, I think, Satan. And the other one was talking about a role-playing game. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Die Hard, Krampus, Taming. I feel like there's what something going on What does Taming have here. to do with Krampus or Die Hard? It was a coincidence. Everyone I was with kind of turned to me and they were like, Rim, you're the god of Cedar Point. <laughs> okay. I was very proud of that moment. It's the same thing. These people, they're not hardcore about skiing. Now, you don't have to be hardcore about everything you do. But it's like... They go. They take all the trouble to travel all this way to be at a ski Maybe resort. Maybe they live next door, and they're just like, whatever. Uh, a lot of them are from New York. I could overhear their conversations. <laughs> the mountains in New York, and everyone, almost everyone there is from New York. New York City. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that they're they're there to ski because they enjoy skiing, just like someone who's at an amusement park enjoys amusement parks, or just like someone who's playing Candyland likes Candyland. But they're not. They're scrubs, basically. They're not interested in ever getting beyond... Like, they've achieved minimal basic proficiency at a thing. Enjoy the thing to a degree, but have literally zero interest in moving at any point beyond that initial proficiency. So they show up, they go to the top, they do the same blue square, simple course every time. And this is why Call of Duty is the big game and not Quake. Yep. (laughs) Okay, let's move on. Ah. (laughs) So, uh... It's gaming day. Yeah, I don't really have any news, but I do want to talk about NS2 because during my little vacation here, because I have a lot of days off between, you know, pretty much every day off between uh, Christmas and New Year's, uh, I'm not going back to work until after MAGFest pretty uh, much. Ma- maybe one day. Uh, uh, um, I've been playing a lot of NS2 when I'm not, you know, the rest of the day I'd spend doing anti-shit talk, but during the times when I'm not anti-shit talking... You know, we're kind of... Uh, sliding into two separate courses right now because I've been doubling down on the Counter-Strike. No, I'm doing NS2 big time. And what I started doing is I have a new policy. And the policy is games of NS2 get ruined a lot when no one gets in the comm chair right away. So my new policy is I get in the game. If no one gets in the comm chair of either team, whatever my team is, in five seconds... I get in. And it's I not a bad it. policy because, you know, even if, you know, mm-hmm. before, you know. And sometimes we'd be like, anyone doing it? Uh, I guess I'm doing it. Because if no <laughs> one else will do it, no one has the right to complain if I right. fuck up. As a result, I've done it a lot, and uh, which is kind of annoying because I don't want to do it a lot, but I just, my policy, I keep doing well, it. Well, there's been a lot of nubs lately. There are a lot of nubs because of the Steam sale. Uh, but I've learned a lot of things commanding. Number one, there's not too much micro like there is in StarCraft, so I can actually fucking do it. Two, because I know what the because I played NS for so long I, that I know what you should do. Like in terms.